Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin with late breaking news from the San Antonio Police Department. Just minutes ago, they released these pictures of persons of interest in the deadly shooting of an 11 year old girl, Danita Phillips. That shooting happened in the 5600 block of Walsham Road on August 15th. Another person was hit in that shooting. They are recovering. The suspects are believed to be driving a four door white Dodge with a pink steering wheel cover and a broken tail light. Anyone with any information is asked to call homicide detectives at 210-207-1366 and ask for SAPD detective Perez. It is expected to be among the most heated down ballot races in November. Two district court judges are hoping to fill the un unexpired term of Judge Ray Olivari, who died last January. Paul Venema spoke with both candidates, one running on judicial efficiency, the other on judicial reform. District Court Judge Ray Olivari died last winter following a lengthy battle with cancer. Now, Judges Michael Mary and Melissa Skinner are vying for his bench. On Friday, Governor Abbott appointed Skinner to the job, though an honor, she said, it's not an easy role with an election just over two months away. Absolutely, I'm at a disadvantage, but that's all right because it's a very different time. It's not like this is a regular campaign for anybody. We're going to have the battle of the judges. She will be a sitting judge and I am a sitting judge. So we both have the same advantage and the same disadvantage. Citing the pandemic. This is what democracy looks like! and the summer's civil unrest, Mary said it's time for reform, both in and out of the criminal justice system. The soft underside of the criminal justice system has been exposed. We're in great need of reform, all kinds of reform, and uh, as you know, I'm a reformer at heart. Skinner agreed that the COVID-created backlog is a problem, a problem that merits courtroom efficiency. I spent years and years being the most, or one of the most efficient, if not the most efficient courts in Bear County, and I aim for that always. Skinner most recently served as the judge in 290th District Court. Mary is currently serving as judge in the 37th Civil District Court. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, legislation curbing hatred. A bipartisan group of U.S. representatives just proposed the No Hate Act, a bill that will address hate crimes by improving reporting and education. The bill put forth by Latino Jewish Congressional Congress in response to a spike in hate crimes targeting both of those demographics. Courtney Friedman spoke to local leaders from those communities about what this bill means to them. The Jewish and Latino communities in America are sharing unwelcome common ground, an increase in hate crimes. The latest FBI report shows the number of anti-Latino or Hispanic hate crimes rose over 21% in 2018. Also that year, Jews were the target of a stunning 57.8% of all religious bias crimes, though they make up less than 2% of the population. A new bipartisan bill, the No Hate Act, aims to improve the reporting of hate crimes through law enforcement training, the creation of reporting hotlines, and educational forums. In San Antonio, where on one hand we feel incredibly welcomed and supported, and um, and then on the other hand, we know that there are instances of anti-Semitism and, and even violence. Temple Beth El Rabbi Mara Nathan hosted an interfaith gathering after a mass shooting at a Pittsburgh synagogue. A similar feeling for the Hispanic community after anti-immigrant rhetoric led to a targeted shooting in El Paso. When you make someone less human, then it's easy to be violent. Esperanza Peace and Justice Center Executive Director Graciela Sanchez and Rabbi Nathan both shocked that the FBI report showed more than 85 cities with over 100,000 residents reported zero incidents of these hate crimes. Where you need to go to the police department or to a human rights center, there has to be financial support. Through the Department of Justice, the bill will issue grants to empower state and local governments to improve hate crimes reporting. Also to teach our children Children, that's not the way we treat other human beings. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. We have learned the name of a man killed in a shooting on the city's east side over the weekend. The Bear County Medical Examiner says 55-year-old William Vaughn Lewis died Saturday. According to San Antonio Police, Lewis was found that morning in front of a home in the 600 block of Ferris Avenue, bleeding after he had been shot. 
He was taken to a hospital where he died. So far, no arrests have been reported. Detectives are still trying to determine exactly what happened there. Management at an Eastside nursing home selected to care for elderly COVID patients fired an employee who reported problems with its air conditioner. That's according to a lawsuit filed in Bear County that accuses administration at River City Care Center and re, uh, of retaliation and negligence. The nurse who was terminated last month reported to management, called 911 and Texas Health and Human Services 4th of July weekend after cooling issues at the facility caused room temperatures to go up. Staff at the nursing home say the lack of AC caused severe medical distress for some of the residents, two of whom later died. These are sick people. They're elderly. They are needing 24 hour, uh, seven day a week nursing care and medical treatment. Tonight on the night beat, a second person who worked at River City claims they alerted management to cooling problems months ago and nothing was done about it. Time saver traffic now. Let's go to the Trans Guide camera here at 410 in Fredericksburg. That's where this camera is located, but what you're looking at here on the highway is actually the westbound lanes of 410 at Babcock. You can see there's a wreck there that has tied up both uh, both sides of the highway. Traffic is really just squeezing in between those two fire trucks that are there on scene. And uh, you can see the two cars involved in that collision right there. So traffic definitely slow going, something drivers have to be aware of as uh, they're making their way through here at 410 and Babcock. There has never been a year like 2020, especially when it comes to protecting our health. And in keeping with that, this year your flu shot is not only important, it's going to require more of you to get it. Ursula Perry reports on why you should take this shot seriously and start your work to get one now. For most of us, the flu shot is an option every fall. This year, though, doctors are asking that you definitely put it on your schedule. So in thinking about where we're at with COVID this year, anything that we can do to reduce the stress on our hospital systems is really important. While all the work we've done with social distance is likely going to soften the start of the flu season this fall, when businesses and schools open up more and more, that will change. And there'll be some changes this year in how you get a shot. Instead of group clinics, as in years past, most pharmacies will urge you to get an appointment to ensure social distancing. I think I know for a fact that primary care clinics are still going to do them. CVS, Target, a lot of our local retailers, including HEB, are still definitely going to be providing flu vaccines. Finally, the nasal spray for children under the age of 12 has been cleared for use this year, and it'll be more available than in years past. Remembering that the flu vaccine, of course, prevents uh, people from getting the flu or even get, or getting very sick from the flu, but unfortunately it will not protect people from COVID. So to avoid a twin pandemic with the flu and COVID, you'll need to use vaccinefinder.org. Find a place that's offering the flu vaccine first, so you're covered by October. And then later, when the COVID vaccine becomes available over the winter time, you can get that one as well. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. With a momentous presidential election still ahead in the midst of this ongoing pandemic, registering to vote has taken on added significance. Jesse Degollado says its importance is not lost on activists and community groups that are signing up potential voters in places you wouldn't expect, even a parking lot on a hot summer day. Free fried catfish and french fries. That's one way to lure hungry potential voters. It's what a nonprofit community group known as Power does every other Saturday at different locations. We need to get out here and vote because your vote do count. We're promoting peace. We're promoting unity. We got to get together, y'all. We got to. Joining forces with radical registrars, they say 40 new voters signed up at two locations in one day. I'm getting that people are wanting to participate, especially in this election and really have their voice be heard. Nearly 700 and counting, Reifert says, although at times she's had to reinforce why it's essential that African Americans register to vote. And then after I'm able to explain that, we're filling out the form 
quickly. <laughs> Electing the nation's first black president twice, she says, holds an important lesson. We cannot just vote somebody in and not vote in any backup for them. Losing congressional seats during the midterm, she says, disillusioned voters who then believed nothing had changed. Yet now, with continued protests over systemic racism. People who look like me, we need to get involved and we must stay involved. But step one is getting registered to vote. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening, 95 degrees out there. I have to say, it's not too bad out there for mid-August. It's not that oppressive heat. You're right. The, uh, the month so far has trained us in <laughs> July a little bit as well. <laughs> you know, you climatize, you get acclimated to 100 degrees every day, and then 95? Well, it's not so bad, right? It, it's funny how it is very different later in the season opposed to early in the season, even with the cold. All right, aquifer, it's down just a tenth of a foot and we're about a foot, a, or about a foot below the August average, but we're still stage one restrictions. Take a look at our pollen count. Mold high at 9,500, ragweed and fall elm both on the low end. A few spotty showers in the hill country, some embedded downpours there with lightning and thunder. They're really falling apart right now and not lasting. And then you get down closer to Choke Canyon, especially east of Choke Canyon, Three Rivers, another downpour. High temperature today of 98, that's two degrees above average, and five degrees below the record, which was set back in 2013. Right now we're mostly in the 90s, 93 Bandera, we're 94 in Pleasanton, 77 though in Rock Springs, some outflow boundaries and rain cooled air there. This evening, those stray showers coming to an end soon. Otherwise, clear sky temps making their way into the 80s. An update on Marco and Laura and our rain chances coming up. Eighteen update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting uh, 109 new cases of COVID-19, which brings the total to 45,364 since this uh, pandemic began. Our seven-day moving average is now 148. Uh, we do unfortunately have four new deaths to report that brings our total to 725. These, these deaths occurred between July 7th and to today. And uh, again, please remember to keep these folks and their families in our prayers uh, because these are uh, family members, neighbors, colleagues uh, who we've lost. Tonight in the hospitals, reporting 473 people in the hospital, which is down five from yesterday. 40 new admissions to the hospitals, 207 total in ICU, and 193, excuse me, 139 on ventilators. Those numbers are all moving in the right direction with 59% of our ventilator capacity and 17% of hospital beds available. Our hospital system again remains under high stress. As, ev as always, on Mondays, uh, we provide an update on our progress and warning indicators to give you kind of a global picture of what's going on with the pandemic in our community. And so let me go through some of those uh, indicators right now. Uh, from the graphic, you can see the 14-day uh, trend in the cases is, is moving steadily downward, and that's a good thing. There was a rebound of cases between August 7th and August 10th, but uh, we need to keep working towards a continuous decline Decline, and I'm happy to say that that is occurring uh, overall. On the case and contact tracing, similar to last week, we currently have the uh, capacity to process 1,400 cases daily uh, as needed. This past week, again, our average daily cases was 143, so we're looking good there. We're continuing to see a gradual decline in hospitalizations, as I mentioned. Our daily ICU and ventilator numbers are also continuing to decrease modestly week by week. Our goal is to reduce the spread of the virus so that daily hospitalizations, ICU visits, uh, ventilator needs, et cetera, go, continue to go down. And for the third week in a row, daily hospitalizations are on the decline. Our case doubling rate is holding steady in the green uh, zone at 40 days, and that is well above our goal. And some very good news uh, today, the positivity rate of cases declined again, and for the first time in quite some time, we are below 10%. In fact, we are at 9.9% .9 positivity reporting this week. That's good. Uh, remember, though, our goal is to get below 5%, and that's particularly important as we get closer to schools opening. 
And as I mentioned earlier, there's less stress on our hospital system, but it still remains under high stress. And so our overall risk level in the community is also moving down, and it's moderate uh, this week. Again, we must all do our part to, to keep it there and keep this uh, trend moving in the right direction. So please mask up and keep physical distance from others. Let me turn it over to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And uh, when you do look at these uh, weekly reports, it really gives us a better picture of what's happening. When you do the daily ones, it kind of uh, stacks up and it can vary from day to day. But the weekly ones uh, really begin to show you where we're headed and we're certainly headed in the right direction. But it also uh, means that we can't let up and we have to continue to do the things that we're doing. Uh, let me thank Jane Hartman for this scarf. It's a Texas scarf for the 150th anniversary. And uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate her doing that. I hope you guys are doing okay out there. Uh, you're really making it work, and you need to keep it up. Hope you're getting a little work done around the house. You know, I was reading an article today where everybody was really plowing more money back into their homes, and I think we all like to do some of that. I know we got rid of a barbecue pit so we could put in a, a treadmill so we could text Tracy and get more exercise, and we're planting plants. And anyway, I think that's that's good and healthy to be outside and. Um, and doing those sort of things, so so keep it up. Uh, we will be closing the parks uh, uh, as we approach uh, Labor Day. Uh, uh, we'll be closing from 9 p.m. on September the 4th till uh, 9 a.m. on September the 8th, and I think the city uh, will also be uh, moving in that um, same direction. So uh, we're on a good track, and uh, let's keep it up, and uh, if we uh, continue to do what we're doing, we're going to be able to meet this flu season, and uh, hopefully do very well during the flu season as well as uh, we continue to fight off the COVID. Great. Thank you, Judge. And, and as a re reminder, we, we knew where we were back in May. Things were moving in the right direction. And uh, we, by and large, let our guard down and, and things started to go in the wrong direction. We saw what happened in July and August. So if you're planning ahead, let's make sure we have a safe Labor Day and we can get towards school opening in a safe manner. Uh, so again, please, as you're planning, uh, ensure make sure that you know that uh, city parks are closed during Labor Day weekend as well in accordance with the county's orders as well. All right, several notes of optimism and improvement in today's daily briefing on the local status of COVID-19 cases. The mayor today saying that for the first time in quite a while, the local positivity rate has dropped below 10 percent. Right now we're at 9.9%. .9%. They have long said that goal is to get us at around 5% or less, especially as schools uh, get closer and closer to in-person learning. Uh, the seven-day rolling average continues to go down, and our risk level now is at uh, sitting at moderate in the green zone if you're keeping track of the color-coordinated efforts on the city's website. Meanwhile, 100 new cases today bring in our total since all this began back in March of 45,364. Four new deaths to report today bring in our total to 720. But they said those deaths, some go back to July 7th and as early as today. Uh, so the numbers continue to be good. The hospital's still under high stress, but ventilators now at 59%, available beds also at 17%. So we continue to move in the right direction here. Yeah, they're saying that what we're doing is working. We just have to keep up with it right. as we move forward. Let's turn to weather now. Let's see uh, what's going on out there. Not only here locally, of course, Adam, everybody is looking at the tropics right now. Yeah, we are. We're tracking the tropics because we've got the two systems out there. Marco, really nothing to talk about much anymore. The focus is really shifting to Laura. So let's give you a quick little update. You look at tropical storm Marco, barely even a tropical storm. I mean, by a mile per hour or two, and that's about it. And it's weakening as it moves westward right along the Gulf coastline toward from Florida toward Louisiana right now and it, this has a general west northwesterly movement at eight miles per hour and you notice from the center of the storm the rain is shifted far to the east of it you have the thunderstorm activity far removed from the center of that storm over the Florida panhandle this is not going to even bring a whole lot of rain to Louisiana let's go to the forecast for Laura max winds now at 60 miles per hour with some gusts at 70 it's likely to strengthen maybe even very rapidly as it heads into the Gulf of Mexico into tomorrow. So we could see some rapid intensification as it approaches the Gulf coastline somewhere between about Galveston and Lafayette, Louisiana. So we're talking far east Texas there and Lake Charles area and parts of Louisiana coastline west of New Orleans as a category two, maybe even category three hurricane. There is the possibility of that. Now notice this path that takes the rain 
east of San Antonio. The heaviest rain is going to be right along the path of that storm. So for us, rain chances looking pretty slim. I mean, we could see over five inches in parts of Louisiana and East Texas, but around here, Maybe an isolated shower or two, 20 to 30 percent chance this week. Tomorrow, sunny, 74 in the morning, 99 by the afternoon, and there's that 20 to 30 percent chance. Maybe an isolated shower and still near 100 for the rest of the week. All right, thanks, Adam. The Army is coming for the Roadrunners, Greg. Got to be their second meeting. What's kind of neat about this is it fills in a gap that was left by Dominion, who was Old Dominion, who, by the way, bowed out, as a lot of the schools did for fall sports. And when we come back, how is that going to affect the UTSA lineup for this fall? That's 11 games and counting so far. And also, we come back, we've got more to show you, including both the Aggies and the Horns in the top 25. UTSA Roadrunners football team has agreed to play Army at home in the Alamo Dome on October the 17th. The move gives UTSA now 11 total games with six of them at home, and this will be the second meeting between these two teams. After their first last year, the Black Knights were able to win it 31-13, a game that saw Frank Harris suffer his first injury to his shoulder that would eventually lead to his exit for the season in Game 4 against North Texas. UTSA was originally slated to play Old Dominion in Conference USA matchup on October the 17th, but the Monarchs decided not to play fall sports this season due to the coronavirus. Road Owners are still on schedule to kick off their 2020 season on September the 12th in San Marcos against Texas State. Fighting Sex Aggies are ranked 13th in the country. That's according to the first Associated Press college football poll released today for 2020. That is the same location the Aggies are ranked in the USA Today coaches poll following an 8-5 finish last year that included one of the most difficult schedules in all of college football, including three number one ranked teams in the, some point in the same season, Clemson, Alabama, and eventual national champion LSU. The Aggies would finish 4-4 four four in the SEC. Right now, the team doesn't pay too much attention to those national rankings. We don't pay attention to it at all. You know, we're just going out, going to practice, controlling what we can control, you know, going out and taking uh, taking game reps at practice. If we take game reps at practice in the game, we'll be where we want to be. So, you know, we just stay focused, you know, you know, just stay focused, just doing what we have to do. And we're not even worried about that right now. We're worried about fall camp and, you know, that's the most important thing right now. Meantime, the Texas Longhorns are ranked right behind the Aggies at number 14 overall, according to the first Associated Press college football poll. This is the second straight season UT has been ranked at the top 15 of the preseason poll following their 10th ranking last year. So far, have been ranked in all four years under head coach Tom Herman. Under Herman, the Horns have won 25 games and included a 10-win season in 2018. 3-0 and in bowl games, including last year's 38-10 win over 11th-ranked Utah in the Valero Alamo Bowl. Here's a look at the top 25. And keep in mind, the Associated Press did allow voters for teams who would be not be playing in these unprecedented times for this preseason poll only, not for any other poll after this. It includes Clemson at number one, followed by Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia, Oklahoma in the top five. Second half of the top ten looks like this includes LSU, Penn State, Florida, Oregon, Notre Dame, and rounding out the top 25 of teams of interest in this area, Texas A&M at 13, Texas at 14, Oklahoma State at 15. Miami Hurricanes and the Miami Dolphins will allow fans in the stands at both of their season openers with no more than 13,000 socially distanced fans, or about 20% of the state capacity, which is 65,000 seats. The move has angered Buffalo head coach Sean McDermott since the Bills play in Miami on September the 20th, and the Hurricanes will follow the same protocol for their home opener against UAB on September the 10th. 15 of the NFL's 32 teams have decided not to allow fans in the stands early in the season, including the Houston Texans, but this plan was approved by the governor of Florida in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that having uh, something to look forward to uh, does give people uh, a bit of hope. I think this is a, a good sign that the Dolphins are being so thorough about their plan. Uh, this is obviously a limited plan, but if you look at what they've done, it's really, really well thought out. If you are someone that doesn't want to wear a mask, this isn't the place for you this year. Don't buy a ticket. Don't come. Um, we're we're going to expect everyone to wear a mask, to be respectful of each other. Uh, we're confident that people will. And to be honest with you, high school football will be the guinea pig. And that all starts this Thursday to find out how it actually develops out there. We'll be watching yeah. closely. Mm -hmm. See Thank what you, happens. Greg. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is up next.
First, it was the Democrats, and this week it is the Republicans. Democrats took the stage last week for their own convention. This week, Republicans take the stage, or at least a virtual one, yeah. in some cases for the Republican National Convention. For today's case at Q&A, we'd like to bring in Dr. John Taylor, Chair of Political Silence and Geography at UTSA. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. Uh, first, I want to ask what you think Republicans need to set out to accomplish over these next few days during the convention. Well, what they first need to accomplish is catch up. They're down. Uh, Donald Trump is down to Joe Biden by nine points. Is it is it you know insurmountable? No, it's not. In fact, previous elections will show that that after the convention, as we get into September and October, it will narrow. The margin will definitely narrow. So Trump has to make a case. That's the biggest thing. Make a case for why we have to rehire him for four more years. He is awfully good at feeding plenty of red meat to his base. Uh, we know that he likes to talk to the base. What does the president need to do to go beyond the base and reach out to those voters who might be independent or might be sitting on the fence at this point and don't know where to go? He's going to have to talk about such things as, as where he's going to take, take the country in terms of what happened after, after the meltdown in, in March and April, um, how we're going to resolve the COVID-19 crisis, um, how we're going to basically restart the economy. Um, jobs, jobs, jobs. He better be talking about that. There's also worries uh, about law and order, and that is a theme that's going to be touched on, I think, all four days of the Republican convention. The GOP has said that they are not releasing a platform during the RNC. Is that unique? It's unique. It's a little bit. Uh, it, it, in fact, it kind of just stunned me when I saw that they're not doing any sort of platform whatsoever. It's just a, it's talking points that that the Trump Pence campaign put out yesterday um, and that they'll fill in the details later. Traditionally, at least for the last 150 plus years or more, political parties have put together platforms that have taken a couple of months with committees and approval by, by the national conventions. This is a little bit different, and it's, it is, in some respects, kind of emblematic of Donald Trump that it's all about talking points as much as anything else. The president already made an appearance there in Charlotte today after accepting the nomination. He's back in Washington now. We're, we're expecting to see him every night of the convention. Is there a risk of seeing too much Trump during this uh, this convention? I don't know. Ask Donald Trump. He's been pretty exposed for the last 40 years or so on TV, newspapers, radio and everywhere else. Um, he'd probably make the argument, no, uh, the more exposure, the better, because he controls the message for the next four days. What do you think voters at home need to be watching for this week, whether they are already decided or whether they're on the fence, as Tim mentioned? Are there certain uh, key messages that that really we ought to be tuning into as we watch everyone speak? Again, like I mentioned earlier, he needs to make the case of why he deserves to be reelected. Um, what's he going to do for the next four years? What are we going to do in terms of everything from trade to China to uh, building national defense? Um, to taxes, uh, capital gains tax supposedly is going to be floated out there again, possibly a cut in income tax. That's the sort of stuff he's going to make a case to the people that are undecided. The president and folks on the right were very critical of the Democrats, saying they, they painted a very bleak picture of America. They're expecting to have a lot of uh, patriotism in this. I mean, how are they going to set themselves aside from, from the Democrats? Oh, they'll, they'll make the message, you know, they'll, they'll, the message they'll, they'll give will be basically the Democrats not only are, are negative, they're too far to the left, they're socialist, um, that they're going to take the country in a, in a direction. And you've seen it already by looking at the, the riots in Portland, for example, and, and, and a variety of other political movements. Uh, unfortunately, this is typical of American politics in which, you know, both parties play to at least for a time, play to a more, I wouldn't call it extreme, but definitely to the more more interesting elements of their parties. And then they move toward the center as we get toward the general election. Certainly the pandemic is taking its, its own key role in politics uh, throughout this entire campaign. So we saw Democrats last week do most things, almost all virtually. Republicans this week, we've already had an in-person uh, event this morning, lots of crowds gathered there. How do you think the pandemic is going to play into the RNC? Well, I think it plays a huge role. The, the question, again, is about, about competence of this administration, um, how successful they've actually been in, in handling the crisis. There was a poll yesterday released that, that showed a, a stark difference between Republicans and Democrats over the handling of it and the acceptance of, of 175,000 plus people dead. There's, there's a real difference in this regard in how Republicans and Democrats view this issue and how we go forward from there.
In 2016, uh, the president painted himself as the ultimate outsider who is going to Washington to drain the swamp. He's been in charge now for three and a half years. He continues to, you know, poke at uh, agencies that he's in charge of. Is it possible to run as an incumbent as it's still an outsider? Well, he's going to try, obviously. You can make the argument that Ronald Reagan did that in 1984 to, to, to some success, obviously. On the other hand, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992 didn't succeed by running in some respects as not necessarily the outsider, but kind of a, kind of an anti-Washington sort of guy. It, it's not a strategy. It's necessarily a winning strategy, but it plays well to the political base, which is important. Energize the base, get them out in November. And, you know, honestly... For people to say right now, for example, that, oh, Biden's got this in the bag, ask that to President Hillary Clinton. Hmm. All right, Dr. John Taylor, Chair of Political Science and Geography at UTSA, thanks so much for being with us. We've got a lot to watch over these next couple of days. Thank you for your time. We'll be right back. News around America now. Police in Massachusetts searching for a man they say gave Walmart shoppers what he called a COVID hug. It happened in Springfield earlier this month. According to police, the suspect walked up to someone taking something out of his hand and then gave them a hug saying, quote, just giving you a COVID hug. You now have COVID, end quote. Then the suspect laughed and walked away. Authorities say this person did the same thing to several other customers. TSA says it is going to keep the change. A lot of it anyway. The Transportation Security Administration says it's holding on to $926,000 last year in change in cash left behind by travelers at airport checkpoints. The agency says it makes an effort to return lost money to travelers, but that it spends what's left over. TSA says it has collected more than $3.5 million in forgotten change in cash over the years. The most cash left behind at JFK in New York, about $98,000. It all adds up, huh? It does. Look outside with live cam, 95 degrees for us right now. Adam, everybody's really talking about what's going on in the tropics and what that's going to mean for us here. Yeah, and unfortunately, it's not going to mean a whole lot for us, especially in terms of rain chances. We'll have very minimal impact from those systems. 98 was our high temperature today after low of 73. And the only triple digit reading on the map today was Del Rio at an even 100. We'll be back to talk about Marco and Laura and the updated forecast pass coming right up. If you had trouble with some of your Zoom meetings today, you weren't the only one. The video conferencing app was having outages, widespread outages. In the U.S., the problem began on the East Coast Monday morning and then started spreading. It didn't just affect businesses. It hampered the first day of remote learning for some schools. And there was plenty of headaches to go around. Users in the United Kingdom also reported having problems. The company says they figured out what was causing those problems. Service to most users was restored to normal before lunch. A lot of us relying on that. Yes, indeed. In the buzz today, it's been a while since we talked about box office openings. We all know why, but the past, this past weekend, the new Russell Crowe thriller Unhinged hit theaters with a $4.4 million debut. Now, in normal times, that would not qualify as a hit movie. But this is the first widely released movie since the pandemic hit. Playing on 1,800 screens in North America, there were also smaller releases including Tesla starring Ethan Hawke as Nikola Tesla and Shia LaBeouf's gangster film The Tax Collector. AMC, the world's largest movie theater chain, opened more than 100 U.S. locations on Thursday. Pricing for opening day tickets, just 15 cents. Yeah, I can't wait to see if people... Go back like we were. Yeah. If there was ever a day to have breakfast for dinner, that's it. Today is it for a lot of people. It is National Waffle Day. August 24th is the day that Cornelius Swarthout received a waffle iron patent in New York in 1869. Waffles were around before that. The waffle iron just made them more readily available. The waffle dates back to the 14th century. Now to qualify as a waffle, a food just has to have leavened batter or dough heated between two patterned plates. It sounds like waffle fries do not qualify. <laughs> Ego frozen waffles first showed up in grocery stores back in 1953. Maybe the most popular waffle though, the Belgian waffle made its debut at the World Fair in 1964. And if it weren't for the creation of the waffle, we wouldn't have waffle houses. <laughs> and where would we be then? That's right. Right.
Can't All right, have a so road trip without a waffle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Caskey, how do you feel about the waffles? To say, oh, There's a lot news. of science. I learned a lot. He's yeah. waffling between what to think ah, about. It. Ah, look at this. Okay. He's in Spreester's okay. spot over there, and then it just keeps it up. Contagious. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, <laughs> scary, <laughs> scary. Anyway, let's talk about the tropics, a little bit of rainfall that we have out there, and unfortunately, no big boost in our rain chances as a result of any tropical moisture. But over the past few hours, we had a few. Showers popping up in the hill country, some embedded downpours there. They were brief though and didn't leave a whole lot of rainfall, just reduced the visibility better than nothing and had a little bit of lightning and thunder. Down near Three Rivers and especially just east of Three Rivers, a quick thunderstorm as well, particularly in northern Bee County. But that's really it for now. We're looking at the tropics. Of course, we have Marco and Laura. We're going to start with Marco, which now is basically just some areas of rain over the panhandle of Florida and moisture now getting fed into Georgia. Its center of circulation is far away from the actual rainfall and its max winds are only around 40 miles per hour. This is going into Louisiana and it's going to rapidly fall apart. It should be downgraded probably later tonight to a tropical depression. But even once it's downgraded, it retains the name of Marco. Then we get Tropical Storm Laura. This is affecting parts of Cuba, but the center of circulation is about to cross over western Cuba. And as it moves into the Gulf of Mexico, particularly tomorrow and into Wednesday, that's when we are expecting some strengthening of this system. Very warm waters and a little more favorable upper level wind support and it's not interacting with any land in the central Gulf of Mexico. So we could actually have some rapid intensification here. National Hurricane Center currently has it as a category two making landfall by Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. I wouldn't be surprised if it even would become a category three. There's that possibility and most of the uncertainty associated with Laura is in terms of intensity and not necessarily landfall. We're talking anywhere from about just east of Houston through Lake Charles, Lafayette area area, but staying clear of Houston and New Orleans. They're outside that zone of that cone of uncertainty. And then the remnants of it as it weakens and especially the rain goes up into the mid south and then arcs eastward into the mid Atlantic. So I'm putting the rainfall potential on this with the forecasted path and you see, of course, right along the path of that storm, the heaviest rainfall for us. We don't even get the leftovers of it. We're talking right along the Texas Louisiana state line, four or five inches of rainfall. You get into San Antonio here, our neck of the woods. Uh, we're, we'll be lucky to get a few isolated showers. Even our eastern counties and communities, Lavaca County, Hallettsville area, even get into Smiley. Maybe a few isolated showers and that's it, but no good accumulations really coming from that tropical moisture. So you look at temperatures, 81 in Rock Springs, 79 in Laredo. Yeah, there's some outflow boundaries and some rain cool there there. 92 meanwhile in Catula as you go up by 35, the temperatures spike quickly outside of those showers. And here in San Antonio, we're at 95. So tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to readings in the upper 60s in the hill country, low to mid 70s elsewhere. Very seasonable weather with sunshine right off the bat tomorrow. And then high temperatures, upper 90s, just barely hitting 100 in some parts of South Texas. Catula, Austin, maybe even New Braunfels at 100 for a few hours. But most of us in the upper 90s tomorrow. You even get into the Lackland Von Army area, about 97. Timberwood Park burning 95 for your highs in Seguin. Topping out at 99 tomorrow. Wall to wall sunshine, just another hot day, 10% chance of a shower. And then with the tropical moisture far to the east of us, we may get a few isolated little showers or thunderstorms Wednesday through Friday. We're giving it only a 20 to 30% chance. Otherwise, we're looking at sunshine and more highs, upper 90s, right near 100. That pattern continues. All right, thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. The stress from the pandemic pushing people and putting families in the danger zone of domestic violence. City and county officials with the Collaborative Commission on Domestic Violence meeting today trying to tackle the problem in our communities. Members of the Collaborative Commission on Domestic Violence hoping to spread the word about how to prevent future domestic violence tragedies. You can text 911 now. You can apply for a protective order online now at BearCountyProtectiveOrders.org. You can make a 
safety plan for how to safely exit a relationship by contacting the SAPD non-emergency number or the shelter. A lot of unanswered questions remain after a man was stabbed on the west side. It happened in the 300 block of Cypress Way Drive. Police tell us they found the victim with a stab wound to his upper body. He was taken to the hospital with life-threatening injuries. Police are still, though, trying to gather information, hoping to find out what happened here and who is responsible. California firefighters working non-stop to try and get wildfires burning across the state under control. At least seven people have died in those fires, which have burned through nearly one million acres. About 100,000 people have been evacuated from their homes. And happening this week, our latest KSAC community event, a virtual town hall talking about mental health. Some people say this pandemic has impacted their mental health. That includes dealing with the loss of loved ones. We're going to address some of your concerns during our virtual town hall. Again, it is this Wednesday from 2 to 3 in the afternoon. You're going to be able to learn the signs of mental illness, how to report it, and where to seek help. That town hall will be streamed on KSAT.com. We have some late breaking news before we go. A few moments ago, the Bear County Sheriff's Office announced an arrest of a former detention officer at the Juvenile Justice Center. Salvador Herrera was arrested for a second degree felony for online solicitation of a minor. Herrera met a 16 year old female victim while she was in juvenile detention, according to the Sheriff's Office. When she was released, the two kept in contact through social media. That's where the sheriff's office says the two exchanged video and pictures of a sexual nature. BCSO also says Herrera would send the victim cash and jewelry in exchange for those pictures and videos. Sheriff Salazar believes there may be other victims and are asking them now to come forward. We'll continue to follow it. Thanks for watching.